Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries. I'm your host, John, and today I'm going to be talking about what you should do when you hit a blank spot. Okay, so we've all been there. You're all ready to start your prep. Somehow you've cleared time in your busy schedule and you've got a few sweet, sweet moments to get your game planning done for the week or whatever interval you choose to play in. And then as you sit there looking at the blinking cursor on your writing program or pen and paper, if you prefer, your mind goes blank and your ideas seem to disappear like the morning mist after the rain. Now, ideally, if you've got enough time, you can just relax, wait for your mind to be a little less frazzled or occupied with other stuff. And at some point, the block will disappear and the ideas will pour forth. But what if you don't have all the time in the world? Well, here's a few things I do when I'm facing a lack of inspiration to try and jumpstart the old creative juices. Hopefully, some of them might work for you. Number one. First of all, take a deep breath and try and relax a little. You're not alone in this. Even professional writers suffer from this, hence the term writer's block. I'm often amazed by how stressful it must be if your living depends on you being able to churn out writing product regularly when you face writer's block. I've often gotten stressed about it enough when I'm trying to prep a session because I feel like I'm letting the team down and my livelihood isn't in the balance. I'm just enjoying a hobby with friends. However, getting stressed out about it can be counterproductive. The more pressure you put on yourself, the more difficult it can be to get beyond the oh my god, I've got no ideas stage. Now, some people thrive on this pressure, others not so much. If you fall into the not so much camp, try and relax as much as possible. Take a minute or an hour away from the writing, have a relaxing bath, a walk, whatever you've got to do, just something to try and get your mind out of that rut and force yourself to not think about it, which I know sounds counterintuitive, but there you go. You'll be surprised, though, how often inspiration can strike when you're not actually deliberately looking for it. Number two look at some non-gaming inspiration-based sources. Now, don't get me wrong, reading through gaming books and tomes of lore can be good as well. Hell, I've got shelves upon shelves of gaming books that I really enjoy reading, but there's a plethora of material out there that, whilst not specifically written for gaming, can provide some great inspiration. For myself, two of my non-gaming favourites are 14 Times, the magazine of odd and weird phenomena. I've got a subscription to this magazine. We've got piles of magazines around the house. It's our sort of bathroom book reading, if you will. The eclectic mix of bizarre Fortiana and events makes it easy to just pick up and flick through a couple of issues. And I'll normally see something that grabs my attention in part or as a whole. And obviously you don't need to take something wholesale. You can just magpie little bits and pieces from hither, thither, and yon. My second non-gaming favourite is the Hellborzine. Named after a poisonous psychotropic plant, it's a collection of writings and essays devoted to British folk horror, history, archaeology, etc. Six issues of the zine have been released so far, and they've all been really good. I've really enjoyed them. The company has also produced a small book entitled The Hellbore Guide to Occult Britain, which I've got a copy of and very much enjoyed. And it covers a wide variety of legends, lore and occult shenanigans from around Britain. Obviously, they're only sort of touched on in the surface level, but for a quick reference book that enables you to sort of set off and do your own research, it's very, very cool indeed. Like I say, I've greatly enjoyed it. Reading these strange and odd legends often gives me great ideas for fantasy games, but you can find a lot in these for any genre. And I'll put a link to where you can get these two things from in the description of the episode, in case you're interested. Another good resource is films, novels, and comics. They don't have to be from the genre that you're running the game in. After all, a lot of this stuff can easily be reskinned. You know, you just change the names a bit, file off a few period specific details, and you're good to go. But you should look at films, comics, etc., that you either like or that you find interesting. Stuff to inspire you and get your creative juices flowing. 
I love my Cthulhu mythos and cheesy old horror films, for example. So I've got a lot of those that I can watch, you know, like uh, Hammer horror films, um, Hammer House of Suspense and stuff like that. But I've also got action films, sci-fi films, a few noir films. Although I must get some more of those, to be honest. My collection's a little bit smaller, those. Murder mysteries and other stuff like that. There's also a number of places that make short films available for free. One of these is the Alter YouTube site. I watch their shorts quite regularly. They put out a couple a week. And whilst the quality can vary, they often contain some very interesting ideas. And I normally come away from watching ones, even the ones that I maybe didn't like quite as much, with a couple of interesting thoughts and ideas. And like I say, the point of this isn't for you to be able to wholesale lift an adventure or a session from these inspirational materials. It's just to put more ideas into your mind, to give it more stuff to churn through, to glom together and come up with something that you can use in your game. And my next point is to pick a starting point and go from there. Another thing I'll sometimes do is pick a starting point and try and work from there. It sounds obvious, but one of the most daunting hurdles to get past can be the blank page stage that we discussed at the start, you know, with the blinking cursor or the empty notebook. Sometimes I'll just pick a word or an image. For example, a castle on a hill with a lightning storm. A man staggers out of the woods clutching a piece of bloodstained cloth. A woman walks alone through a large city. The streets are deserted and silence is everywhere. And then once you've got that starting point, you'll find yourself asking some questions about that. Who lives in the castle on the hill? Why is there a lightning storm behind it? Who's the man coming out of the woods? Whose blood is it on the cloth? Where were all the people in the mysterious deserted city? Is this on Earth? Is it on some strange alternate dimension or planet? And once you start asking those questions and you've got that starting point, you can then look for media or reference material that invokes that concept. For instance, if I wanted to do a session based around vampires, I would grab a load of books and films about vampires. I'd probably read some articles about real life cases of vampirism. Wikipedia is great there. I know it's not the most accurate thing in the world, but it doesn't have to be. It's research for an RPG. But also, I'd probably look at things associated with them like porphyria, uh, blood, addiction, stuff like that. The aim of picking a starting point is just to get yourself moving and jog you out of that rut. But once you've started the ball rolling, don't restrict yourself unnecessarily. If you're researching vampires and you see something else that doesn't fit in with that, but it grabs your attention anyway, the mere fact that it's grabbed your attention suggests that it's probably worth going with it after all, even if you don't use it for this session, you might be able to use it at some point in the future. Another good resource for things like this are newspapers and news TV broadcasts. I don't know about other countries, but certainly here in the UK, newspapers will often have like a weird little sort of filler story at the end of the major news, you know, when they need to fill up a little bit of time or newspapers will sometimes have like little bizarre stories in them or local interest stories. And whilst using a, a sort of big scale news story of current events might not be the thing to do with your group, depending on what your group and you like, it might be great for you, but it may not. Using these little obscure things is often a really good sort of easy way of getting some bizarre inspiration for your games. And finally, my number four is use a publish module. If you still can't think of an idea for a homebrew session, just find a published module that you find entertaining and use that. There's no shame in that whatsoever. I personally prefer to run homebrew stuff myself, but hell, I'll take a published module in part or even in whole if I'm struggling for ideas for my own adventures. I mean, after all, that's sort of what these modules are there for. Someone else has already put a lot of the work in, but as you read and tweak this material, you'll undoubtedly find yourself making the module your own as you run it. And these little tweaks and changes that you put in will make it suitable for your setting and something different from what another person would run in a module, even though you're ostensibly looking at the same module. As we spoke about in our Grab a Map episode, 
Images and maps can also be powerful material for getting the old grey cells firing. So there we are. Those are just a few things that I do when I'm facing a bit of a mental block in trying to get ready for a game. Take a deep breath, try and relax a little look at some non-gaming inspiration sources, and I hope to be talking about some of the books, the non-gaming books that I use as reference material and sources of inspiration in episodes later on this week. Pick a starting point and go from there, and if you still can't think of anything, just use a published module. It's absolutely fine. So, that's what I do when I'm facing a bit of a block. I'd love to hear some of your suggestions as to what you do when you're facing a bit of writer's block. If you want to get in touch with us and let us know to talk about this or anything else, we'd love to hear from you. We might even feature you in a future bonus voicemail episode. Currently, the voicemail response episodes are only going out on the podcast, not on the YouTube channel. But hey, if enough people want to go on the YouTube channel, we can do that in the future. Let us know. And the ways you can let us know and get in touch are you can leave us a voicemail message using either Anchor or SpeakPipe. There's a link in the description down below. Or you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast, or one word, at gmail.com. So please remember to like, share and subscribe and all of that stuff that people normally ask you to do on the internet. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've got something out of this. And until we see you again, take care, stay safe and whatever you're playing, have fun. Mm-hmm.